So I called in my good friend. That's right. It's a crossover now between summer friends and a different world. And I want you to welcome our family, our homeboy, my guy, Dan Thomas, who is going to kick off this A Different World series. Come on, Freedom. Stand on your feet. Give God praise for the prophet who's in the house today, Dan Thomas. Dan, preach a word. Teach us about this different world. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hey, what's up, Freedom family? You know what? While, while we were worshiping, I, 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 I discerned that we were, let me just get a little bit more on this. I, I discerned that we were in a Jericho moment. And this is going to be big time. We were in a Jericho moment, and you're on the seventh day, having gone around six times. And, and there's only one more time left to go. But, but, I, but I need to prepare you for this so that you'll know. How many know the story that I'm talking about? If you have no clue, just copy what everybody else is going to do in a moment, okay? Just, just copy what everybody else is going to do. This is what I discern. In Psalm 146, it says, praise ye the Lord. That's at the beginning of Psalm 146. At the end of Psalm 146, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the beginning of Psalm 147, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the end of Psalm 147, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the beginning of Psalm 148, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the end of Psalm 148, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the beginning of Psalm 149, it says, praise ye the Lord. At the end of Psalm 149, it says, praise ye the Lord. But when you get to Psalm 150, it changes just a little bit, and he says, let everything. Oh, y'all not in the room yet. Y'all not in the room yet. You're getting ready to go around the seven times. He said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do I have anybody that's walking around a wall of Jericho and all you need is your sound? I feel something in here. You might not have money. You might not have access. You might not have resources. You might have not have associations, but you got a mouth. Come on, I need everybody standing real quick. I need everybody standing. Come on, everybody standing. Somebody say this to you never say, open mouths, open heavens. Oh, y'all didn't believe that because y'all waiting on me to tell you when to shout. If you really got it, you would have been shouting already. Open mouths, open heavens. On the count of three, I want you to give a shout and you watch walls fall down. One, two, three, shout. Come on. Come on. Come on. Sustain that. Sustain that. Sustain that. Come on, shout, 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 shout. Come on, shout, shout. For the Lord has given you the victory. Shout. Come on, 20 more seconds. Shout, 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 shout. It's already done. It's already done. It's already done. It's already done. Shout. Father, I thank you. I, I recognize, I recognize that as a prophet, my job is to come and change seasons. And whatever season you in that you don't like, I want you to know the season just changed. The, the, the season looks like this, blessings on blessings. You sowed in tears, but you're now reaping in joy. She, Father, I thank you. The season has changed. So put down your sowing tools, which is tears, and pick up your reaping tool, which is joy. Glory to God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. You, you got to excuse me. I've been in 97 days of prayer. You, you just got to excuse me. So, so, so God works all things well according to his own counsel. And I'm telling you that you are at the precipice and the cusp 
of everything that you've been praying for. There are some of you who are getting ready to receive things that you didn't pray for, but your grandmother and your mother prayed for. Your grandmother, and, and you just happen to be at the right, right place and at the right time to receive. Come on, tap somebody on the shoulder and say, this is my time. This is my time. I, I, I don't listen. I don't need you to be sophisticated today. I, I don't need you to be, you know, trying to look. Look, I need you to open your mouth. Glory. To, this is one of those days. I need you to understand that God has presented you an opportunity. You are under an open heaven. And what you've been praying about is not coming. It's here. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. I know some of you may not know me, but let me instruct you. Stop worrying about whether I can preach because the praise team already did that. If you understand the spirit of God that was moving through this place, you already got what you needed before they got up. So what you need to do is praise to receive what he has already done. Glory to God. Glory to God. Listen, I want to honor the house today really quickly. I feel God. <laughs> I, I feel God this place. I, I just feel like real quick, real quick before we give, I just feel like if somebody would just get radical real quick. Hey, before you get home today, something is going to change in your life. If you would get out of that sophisticated position and tell God, I'm here. And whatever you want to do, you can do it. Glory to God. Glory to God. I need a real praiser. I need somebody that know that you came out of the muck and the mire. It was only God that brought me here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Lord, I said hallelujah. You got to know when your season is changed. In order to change your season, you don't wait for the season to change. You change it with what you say. Because he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Got power in my mouth. Did you know that the word of God in your mouth is just as powerful as it is in God's mouth? He told you to say it. And the reason why we ought to keep saying so, because the world keeps saying it ain't so. This will not be done by natural means. I feel some unconventionalness coming on somebody's life. You've been waiting for, the, I don't know who this is for, but you've been waiting for the right credit score. You've been waiting for things to line up. You've been waiting for every T to be dotted, I's to be dotted, T's to be crossed. It will not be done that way. God is setting you up for a miracle. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm getting ready to preach. But I'm going to just use somebody as an example. I don't know what you've been waiting on right here. But the Lord said you are at the door of what you've been praying about. And God said you will cry no more over this. I change your tears from tears of sorrow into tears of joy. And God said there's a recompense and reward for what you've been going through. When you could have got vengeance for yourself. But you said, no, vengeance belongs to the Lord. I'm not even going to say anything. But you got on your knees, and God said, because you trusted me and did not take it into your own hands, I'm going to give you blessings with the culmination of generations upon you. What your mama didn't get, you're going to get. What your grandmother didn't get, you're going to get. What your great-grandmother didn't get, you're going to get the blessing a generation is upon you. Somebody shout in this place. Glory to God. I hear the Lord saying this. I'm going to renew your youth like the eagles, and I will restore. I will restore all the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust have stolen. I will restore the years. Come on, I will restore the years. 
Oh, y'all don't believe? I will restore the years. I will restore the years. I just got this for you, and I need you to receive it by faith. The struggle is over. The negativity is over. See, you're interested, and you know about four seasons, and I'm moving on. You know about the summer, the winter, the spring, and the fall. But there's another season called due season. That's God's time. Be not weary in well-doing for in what? Due season. You shall reap because you have not fainted. In Jesus' name. Somebody give the Lord a hand. In Jesus' name. I had to get that out. Glory to God. I want to give honor to God and to my friend, my brother, for a very long time. Some of you don't know, we actually met in California. I lived there for 10 years, and we were both doing some stuff in the Southern Baptist Church. And then he left me. He abandoned me <laughs> and came to Texas. And then somehow God worked it out that I would end up where he is <laughs> all over again. I'm going to tell you this about Pastor Robert White. You may already know this, but it needs to be announced in the room. He is literally one of the most excellent preachers and dissectors of the word the world has ever seen. If you sit with Robert for 1.2 seconds, 1.2, don't take long, you're going to get some word. <laughs> you're going to get some word. And so I honor him today. I honor his wife, Marisha, and his children. Glory to God. Their children. And then I want to honor, and I'm going to have them stand today. I know they don't want to. I want to honor my wife and my daughter today. Come on. When they asked me, do I have an entourage, I said, yes, I do. All right, right there, <laughs> right there. Let, let's, let's go to the gospel as John records it. And just look at somebody and say, you won't forget today. Just, just because we haven't come down to the word, we've come up to the word. It's, it's getting ready to get gooder. The, 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 I know that's bad, you know, English, but it's great theology. It's getting ready to get gooder. John chapter 16, and we're going to begin the reading of the word of the Lord at verse 5. And would you just stand for the word of the Lord today? If we, would you do that today? The gospel, as John records it, chapter 16, beginning at verse 5. I'm reading from the New King James Version. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Uh, today, I want to preach to you about a different world. A different world, but here's my subtopic, and subtopic, and I want you to say this after me. Say, after this, it will never be the same again. You will listen. Say, after this, it will never. So you got to put something on that never. 
I need y'all to put some funk on that never. Say, say, after this, it will never be the same again. <laughs> Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Glory to God. I, I, before, before I begin, I want to I wanna say something because I won't have time to come back to it. I know it. In, in verse 8 of this, he says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, when you dissect this, there's a revelation in this that I want you to get. And I think it will take some pressure off of you. He said that when Holy Spirit comes, he will do three things. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus does something in verse 9 that he doesn't do often. He begins to explain in verse 9 what he meant in verse 8. He says, of sin, because they do not believe in me. Everybody say they. So they is a pronoun. It's a pronoun in the Greek. It's also a pronoun in English. And so we need to define and find out who they is. So we got to go back to verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Stop. Verse 9, of sin, because they do not believe in me. I'm going to read it one more time. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of sin, because they do not believe in me. By revelation of Holy Spirit, we understand that the they in verse 9 is the world in verse 8. He will convict the world of sin, of sin because the world does not believe in me. Watch this. The only sin that Holy Spirit is convicting the world of is unbelief in Jesus Christ. I need you to hear this because we preach a lot of stuff about what people need to stop doing, but the root of all of that is unbelief in Jesus Christ. Then he says, then he says, and of righteousness, he says, of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. Now he turns his conversation to his disciples, which would be you and me. The Holy Spirit is not convicting you of sin because Jesus said this and it, it, in his revelation in the word of God that he will be merciful unto your unrighteousness and he will remember your sins. What? No more. The Holy Spirit couldn't be convicting you of your sins because there's nothing for him to convict. I, I, I need you to catch the, the most insane thing a believer can do is to remind God of sins he no longer remembers. I, I told look at somebody say it's a different world. <laughs> it, it's a different world. What Holy Spirit does is convict you of your righteousness. Convict you that what you just did is not you. That you are in a better covenant with better promises. Glory to God. Now, let's, get, let's go to work now. Let's go to work. I had to get that out because that's going to make sense here in a minute. W one of the best ways to understand Jesus in the scriptures is to see him as a man between covenants. He, he, he has one foot in the old covenant fulfilling it, and he has his other foot in the new covenant introducing it. He is a man between covenants. And although Jesus introduced the new covenant, we must understand that Jesus himself was not a minister of the new covenant. In fact, let me throw this on you. Jesus Christ did not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He, he said himself, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What he would do, however, is he would lay down principles of the new covenant that was to come, but ministering the new covenant was not a part of his earthly ministry. Just a note here that Jesus' ministry when he ascended into the heavens did not end. His earthly ministry ended. And according to the revelation of scripture in the book of Hebrews, he is a minister in the sanctuary not made with hands. There, there's a real tabernacle there, the one that God showed Moses by revelation, and Moses made an earthly replica, a copy. Do, do you remember that? He, he made a copy. And I don't really have time to get into that, but let me say this. The things that we build on earth for God, we need to make sure that they first existed in God. Be, be, because, because it is possible to build something on earth for which you have not gotten a pattern from heaven for. 
And when your pattern is not from heaven, God does not have to endorse it. God doesn't have to fund it. God doesn't have to favor it because he never spoke it. And when, whenever God, whenever you do something on earth in the natural, please understand it was already finished in the spirit. You are only doing what has already been finished. This is why the scripture says that the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. And so many people get confused when you talk about the new and the old covenants and they assume that you are trying to do away with the old and only acknowledge the new. But remember in Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, Jesus said, do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. When he says he came to fulfill it, what he means is that he came to fill it to the full. Come on, I need you to listen to me here. Verse 18, the next verse says, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot or tittle, which is equivalent to a period or a comma in the Hebrew, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Now, Jesus said that he came to fulfill it. And if he said that the law won't pass away until it's all fulfilled and he came to fulfill it, then when he fulfilled it, the law was moved out of the way. Come on, come on. Are y'all in here this morning? Listen, listen. Here's what we've got going on today. Unfortunately, most of the modern day church is double minded when it comes to this. They love the grace of God, but because it seems too good to be true, to feel better about it, they add a little law to try to balance it out. It's, It's the grace but kind of language. Yes, there's grace, but you still gotta live holy. Yes, there's grace, uh, but you still can't wear pants. Yes, there are people who still believe that. Most of you would be going to hell with George Bush gasoline draws on right now because you came to church with pants on. It's, it's the grace but kind of language. But can I tell you something? You can't balance grace. You cannot make grace make sense. It's not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be stupefying. It's supposed to be dumbfounding. It's supposed to be completely inconceivable to the point that the only response you have is thank you. Come on, come on. It's grace. It's grace. You don't deserve it. You can't work for it. You cannot earn it. You cannot merit it. It's a gift from God that sees you where you are, but doesn't condemn you for where you are, but then doesn't leave you where you are, but teaches you who you are so you can get up from where you are. That's the grace of God. Paul said this in Romans 5 and 20, where there was much sin, there was more abundance of grace. In other words, the more people sinned, the more God gave grace. I know how that sounds, but here's what you need to know. You cannot out the grace of God. Come on, come on, come on. You cannot out the grace of God. Let me say it another way. There is more grace in God than there is sin in you. Oh, I wish you would receive this. I wish you would receive this. Paul understood that he had preached grace so freely and scandalously in his letter to the Romans that for fear that they would misunderstand his presentation of grace, he comes back in chapter 6, verse 1, and he says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that there may be an abundance of grace? God forbid. How can we who are dead in regards to sin live any longer in it? Then he says, do you not remember? Do you not know that everyone who was baptized in the name of Jesus was also baptized into his death? Now, I got to move on from here, but most of our battle with sin is because we have a partial revelation on what happened on that cross and what happened in that grave and what happened in his ascension and what happened in the seating of Christ at the right hand of the Father. You see, the gospel is not just the death, the burial, and the resurrection. The gospel is the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, the seating, his crowning as king of kings and lord of lords, and then the sending of Holy Spirit. That is the totality of the gospel. Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, we we have shortchanged things, just like we shortchanged Jehovah Jireh. 
oh, he's my provider. But, but when you study what, re- what it really is, it actually means the God who sees before. It's stronger than him just being your provider. The reason why he can be your provider, because he saw your need before you even knew that you had it a need. That's what Matthew 6 and 8 says, that God knows your need before you even knew that you needed it. And the Bible says when Abraham was getting ready to plunge that knife in his son's chest, an angel spoke out from heaven and said, Abraham. Abraham, and he looked behind him, which means that he had to walk past the revelation that God was trying to show him the entire time. I'm talking to somebody that's been so consumed by your trouble and your strategy and your trauma that you couldn't see that the entire time the deliverance was right in front of you. He's the God who sees before. Now, it also says he's the king of kings. Who do you think the other kings are? Come on, come on. Who, who do you think the other kings are? You have been assigned an, an, an ambassador. You are a king in the kingdom. He's the Lord of lords. Who do you think the other lords are? Come on, touch somebody on your row and say, king me. Come on, come on. I need you today. Come on, touch somebody and say, king me. King me, king me. Come on, come on, come on. Look at somebody else and bow to them and say, how are you, my Lord? Come on, because that's who you are. That, that's, that's exactly who you are. Did you, did you know that what the enemy is trying to do is he's trying to make you forget who you really are? Come on, can I, I, I think y'all can handle this. I feel this. I, I think y'all can handle what I'm getting ready to say. Let me, let me ask a question just really quickly. Is there a man in heaven? When Jesus left this earth, was he not in a body? The Bible says there is one man the man Christ Jesus who's a mediator, right, between us and God. Is there a man in heaven? All right. Does God have a plan B? I'm getting ready to drop something on y'all. Does God have a plan B? So if there is a man in heaven and Jesus has committed himself to forever being in human form on our behalf, there's a man in heaven right now, and you just told me that God doesn't have a plan B. Which means that he always intended for a man, someone in human bodily form, although in a glorified body, to be a part of the Trinity. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. What the enemy is trying to do is make you think that you are not part of the God class. Jesus is your representation, not just here on earth, but also there in heaven so that you can know you don't belong to this class. You belong to that class. See, this is where the Holy Spirit, this is what Jesus is teaching on in, 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 in John chapter 16. It will help us to understand the spirit and the ministry of Holy Spirit. See, we're making the same mistake that the Jews made in their day, although it's two different eras in dispensations. They thought that they could get to know the Father better by bypassing Jesus. We think that in our era, we can get to know Jesus better by bypassing Holy Spirit, and we can't do it. This is a different world. He, he has been put, the, the spirit of God has been put in you. Did you know that the God who created all things lives on the inside of you? Let, 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 me, break, let me break it down to you like this. You were made in the image and likeness of God. The God that you were made in the image and likeness of knows everything. Not only does he know everything, he knows everything that was known. He knows everything that is known. He knows everything that could ever be known. The God that knows all of that lives on the inside of you. Why is it that the God that knows everything, whose image and likeness that you are made of, how is it that you know everything about him but very little about yourself? It's not supposed to be that way. You're supposed to know something about you. This is even what Jesus said when Jesus, when they said, you being a man, he said, you call yourself God. He said, it's in your law. It's in your law that you're God. Little G. Look at somebody say, I'm a little G. You may live in the suburbs now, but you know what it means to be a little G. You've got authority. You've got authority. Why don't you start using it? The Bible says this. It says that the earth is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Not for you to become a son of God, but for you to realize that you are. Glory to God. Can I say this to you? That Jesus just didn't die for you. 
He died as you. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Jesus just didn't die for you. He died as you. We have something better than substitutionary death. Thank him for taking my place, but there's something better than substitution, and that's union. When he died for my sins, I died to my sins. When he was buried for my sins, my sins were buried with him. When he rose from the grave, I rose in the newness of life with him. When he ascended into the heavens, I ascended with him, and I'm now seated with him at the right hand of the Father as a joint heir to the throne. You just don't have positional righteous, righteousness. You are righteous. See, see, it's a different world when the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you and he dwells on the inside of you. And many of us, many of us, what, what has happened is that we've got a hold of what I call daisy Christianity. He loves me. He loves me not. He's with me today. Tomorrow, he's not. He's going to bless me if I do good today. But if I do something bad tomorrow, he's not with me. Do you know that Jesus hid us in himself so that the enemy could not understand what he was doing? 2 Corinthians 2 and 9 says, if had the rulers of this world known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Them crucifying him freed us. See, see, see they, they didn't know what they were doing. And if the devil had any wisdom over all the millennia of the earth at all, he would leave you alone. Man, I feel like preaching in this place. He would leave you alone because he's helping you get to where God has ordained you to be. Everything you're going right now, everything that you're going through, everything that you're facing is a plan that God put before the foundation of the world. It is helping you get there. I guarantee you, less than six months from now, what you're crying about, you're going to be praising God about, and you're going to have the same testimony that David said, it was good that I was afflicted. That, that there is never anything that you entered that God did not have an exit for. God said in Isaiah 46 and 10, I know the end from the beginning. God never starts anything he hasn't already finished. When you came out of your mother's womb, that was God saying, I finished you. I, I finished you. I, I don't know who's going. I just feel somebody tugging on me. PD, it sounds good. That's what people call me. PD, it sounds good. I, I love it. But you don't understand what I'm going through. No, I don't understand. But I do understand the end of the plan that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose, not your purpose. I feel my grandmother sneaking up on me right now. And she said, listen, I don't know what's going on. I don't know when it started. I don't know how it started. But here's what I do know. He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. Come on, touch your neighbor and say, wait, 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 wait. Come on, touch as many people as you can. Say, wait, wait, wait. You getting ready to make some rash decisions. You getting ready to act out of character. All you need to do is wait this thing out because God is getting ready to do something extraordinary. God is getting ready to do something gargantuan. God is getting ready to do something unfathomable. God is getting ready to do something that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared. If I can just get three people to yell this, I'll be all right. Somebody say, this is my time. This is my time. Now watch this. We're talking about grace. We're talking about it's a different world. We're talking about after this, things will never be the same again. And I don't mean to belabor the point. But can I tell you this, that God's not good to you because you're good? I just think we need to hear that sometimes. I'm not being blessed because of my performance. My performance is up and down. My performance is sometimes inconsistent. My performance is otherwise unpredictable. I'm being blessed because I trust in Jesus' performance. And when I can't, he will. 
When I want, he will. When I don't know how, he does. It's all him. And so we got to get rid of this double-mindedness. It's, it's, it's the word dipsuhos in the Greek. It literally means to hesitate or vacillate between two opinions. That, that's, that's what it means. Or it describes somebody that has two minds. It is divided loyalty that manifests itself by indecision and doubting. This is what Jesus said, well, meant when he said, you cannot put new wine in an old wine skin. Because if you do, the potency or the power of the new wine will cause the old wine skin to break, and you will lose both the new wine and the old wine skin. In other words, you cannot put a new revelation into an old understanding. You're trying to understand God from your grandmother's generation. And although God was real in that generation, we're too, we're too interested in what God said, and we're not interested enough in what he's saying. See, God is trying to move us. God says, you think that I'm the God that's trying to punish you. You think I'm the God that's trying to get you. You think I'm the God that's sitting having angels with a clipboard follow you and mark everything you do. That's not me. That's, that's religion. That's religion. The, the word religion actually comes from a word that means to bind or to hold one in bondage. That's religion. God says you've got preachers who didn't know they were deceiving people because they were deceived about who I am, my nature and my character. This, this is important for you to understand. God says, I need you to understand that I am the God who knows all things from the beginning to the end. And so God says, I'm not going to unchoose you for something that you did because I chose you before the foundation of the world. If I chose you before the foundation of the world and then put you in time, having chosen you from the foundation of the world, why then would I unchoose you in time when I knew outside of time what you were going to do? You cannot be unchosen because you were chosen before there was a when, a where, a why, a how, or time. God said, I chose you. Jesus told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you. And you cannot be unchosen. And because Jesus took the penalty of death on the cross, you are unpunishable. Many of us are punishing ourselves. Did you know that the worst thing that happened to you is not the worst thing that happened to you? The worst thing that happened to you is to continue to rehearse the worst thing that happened to you. And the enemy is in your head trying to make you think that the worst is yet to come. And God told me to tell somebody at Freedom Church. I feel the Holy Ghost here. At Freedom Church, the worst is behind you and the best is ahead. Let me say it like this. The best days are not ahead of you. The best days are on the inside of you. Glory to God. Now, this, 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 and I'm almost done. This, this, this new covenant thing. When you understand that the message and the method changed. When he put Holy Spirit into you, that was the whole thing. He wanted to get God back on the inside of you. My first point to you is this. Holy Spirit inside you is better than Jesus being beside you. I, I understand. I understand. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is this like that first drink you had that you weren't supposed to have. It didn't go down well. Holy Spirit inside you is better than Jesus being beside you. Where do you get that from? Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. Watch this. The Bible says that Jesus had the Spirit without measure, which means he was the only one who had it. He was only one. This is why he said, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it is good for nothing except to be trampled upon by the foot of men. Jesus understood himself as a seed. And until a seed gets in the ground, the life in that seed cannot come out of that seed. Jesus knew that he was a seed that God planted to reap a harvest from humanity. And when Jesus died, his spirit opened up and released Holy Spirit to all who would believe. Watch this. He said, if I was here on the earth, you'd be limited because Holy Spirit would only be in one person. 
This is why before every great revelation, before every great elevation, there has to be a death of some sort to release what's on the inside of you. God's not killing you, but he is killing something inside of you that can't go to where he ordained you to be. There has to be a baptism of sorts where you die. Something in you dies. Glory to God. Watch this. Here is Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't want to do it. He knew he was in the face of his superior anointing. Jesus said, suffer it to be so now that we might fulfill all righteousness. Why? Because Jesus knew he had to go down before he could go up. Now, this word advantage is really interesting because it means to confer or bestow a benefit. This is what it means. It means to bear or to bring together. Literally, that when the helper comes, he will bear what you cannot bear. He will bring together what you cannot find to put together. He said that Holy Spirit will bring things back to your remembrance. Did you know that the word remembrance means to remember? To take members that were apart and put them back together. That, that you could have forgotten about some 15 years ago. And in the moment of time of witness or prayer, he'll bring something back to your remembrance. He, he'll put things back together. My second point is this. Is Holy Spirit in you will give you what Jesus says to you. This is, he said that the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own. He will only say what Jesus has said, which means, help me, Lord, that most of your conversation needs to be with him. <laughs> most of us don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have a relationship with church. <laughs> a lot of times, Holy Spirit is a crazy uncle that we bring out of the basement when we want to have a good service. Somebody say, he talks. He talks. Listen, Holy Spirit is on the inside of you. His job is to take what Jesus is saying and give it to you. This is why when you wake up in the morning, one of your first things you need to say is, Holy Spirit, what is Jesus saying for me today? This is a different world. You've got God on the inside. Thank God that I'm preaching. Thank God that Pastor Rob is going to be preaching next week. You still need teachers, but you've got the author on the inside of you. I feel the Holy Ghost. You've got the author on the inside of you. Did you know that Jesus is not your Emmanuel? I'm going to break something down to you. You know Jesus is not your Emmanuel. What does the word Emmanuel mean? God, say it louder. God with us. Jesus is not with you right now. Where is he? Where? At the right hand of the Father. And I understand Jesus is in my heart. No, he's at the right hand of the Father doing his heavenly ministry. He, he, is, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He occupied an office called Emmanuel. The Old Testament says this about Jesus, and his name shall be called. In Matthew 1 and 21, the angel told Mary, said, and you shall call his name Jesus. Watch this. You shall call his name, and his name shall be called as two different things. My name to my family is J.R., but they named me Dan. Emmanuel was the office that Jesus occupied, and he was God with us to the Jewish nation. Your Emmanuel is Holy Spirit. He's not only God with you, he's God in you. Somebody say it's a different world now. <laughs> it's a different world. He is the finger of God writing God's laws on your heart, not on tablets of stone. He's no longer preaching from the outside trying to get in. He's on the inside changing you at the heart level and the desire level, telling you exactly what he's saying. And not only is it a different world, it's a better world. It's a better world. I just got a little bit more. Watch this. This is, this, is my, this is my third point. Holy Spirit is in us, moving us from asking for what we need to demanding what is ours. I told you I felt like I was shot out of a cannon today. 
Verse 12 says this, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Why couldn't they bear them? One, they didn't have the spirit of God in them. Even if he told them the truths that he would have laid on them, they would not have been able to comprehend it. Then Jesus' ministry was ending, so the level of revelation, they wouldn't have time to walk it out. But notice what he says. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth or the rest of what I didn't get to say on the earth. I'm going to challenge you with something because I think we heard what I said, but we didn't hear what Jesus said. He said, I still, this is Jesus on the earth. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you and know all truth. Let's just walk this out for a minute on my third point. I want to walk this out. Jesus said, there's a whole lot of stuff that I want to say to you, but I'm not going to get to say That means that everything that Jesus did say that we do have recorded in the Bible is not all that he said. And it's not all that he wanted to say because his ministry was ending, which also means that everything that you have in your Bible is not all that he said. It's not all that he said. John says in his gospel, these and many other miracles did Jesus do, but these are written that you might believe and that by believing you might have life in his name. That's what he said. Everything, And then John went on to say that even if we told you all the things that Jesus said and did, even the books of the world could not contain it. Every, watch this. Everything that Jesus has to say to you will not be in your Bible. It will agree and build on the foundation of what this word says, but everything he has to say to you is not in here. He told his disciples, I got some more stuff to say to you, but it's not going to come from me. It's going to come from Holy Spirit. Are y'all tracking with me here? This is, this is revelation on the way. Listen, everything that Jesus has to say to you, you did not find. There was nothing in the Bible that said, Dan, when you graduate from Northwest Class in High School in Oklahoma City, I want you to go to Langston University. There's no verse there. You cannot tell me that you found a verse on who to marry. You cannot tell me that the address of your house was in Zechariah. It was not there. There are things that Jesus wants to say to you, but he's going to say it through the Holy Spirit. So how important, God help me today, how important is it for you to have a relationship with Holy Spirit? It's a different world now. Then he says, he said, he will tell you things to come. That's an advantage right there, that the, that, that the believer is supposed to know stuff that the world doesn't know. This sounds like Jeremiah 33 and 3 to me. Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Aren't things you don't know things to come, and things to come things you don't know? Sitting around here blind and stupefied about what's going on in the world. You've got a prophetic function on the inside of you called Holy Spirit. He'll tell you things to come. And then my final point. I'm going to quit. I'm not finished. I'm going to quit though. We never finish. (laughs) We just quit. When, When Jesus says... And I'll give you my fourth point, but really quick, when Jesus says this, he says that there are a lot of things that you wanted to ask me, but you haven't asked me. If you keep reading John chapter 16, he says, here up until this point, you've asked nothing in my name. How do you remember that? He said, but after you receive the Holy Spirit, he says, you'll ask me. The word, Jack, that he uses for ask both times is not the same word. He says, up until this time, you've asked me nothing in my name. It literally means to request or to beg or to plead. He said, but when the Holy Spirit has come, he says, you will ask in my name and then I will do what you've asked in my name. The second word he uses is this word aieto, which is not request. The word literally means to demand or require. Watch this. This is important for you to understand because the message and the method changed when Holy Spirit was in you. See, before you got saved and Holy Spirit indwelt you, all things that were Jesus were not yours. Once you got saved, everything that was his that belonged to the Father now became yours. 
Why are you begging and pleading for something that belongs to you? Now, I, I, I need you to get this. I need, Jesus even typified this when he was on his boat with the disciples. They got scared. They say, Master, don't you care that we're getting ready to die? Jesus woke up, rebuked the winds and the waves, walked over to them, and he said these words. He said, where is your faith? He didn't say they didn't have it. He said, where is it? Because you misappropriated it somewhere. In other words, he's saying this, that if you knew who you were, like I know who I am, you could have done this yourself. The Bible says that you've been made like gods, but because of faith and unbelief, you will die like mere mortals. Because we don't know who we are. He said, once you have ownership, you don't ask. You demand. And many of us are hearing demand as command, and that's not the same thing. And that's not what I'm saying. God says, you are a king, you are a lord, you are a son, you are a daughter. And this is why the Bible says in Psalm 103 that the angels hearken unto the voice of the word of the Lord. It's a voice-activated kingdom. It's a voice-activated kingdom. What he's saying is angels get dispatched when you say something with faith and confidence. I, I don't even have to get religious and get scripture. I can just simply say, I can simply say, son, you're not dying today. God told me something and he cannot lie. Oh, I feel faith rising in the room. Well, we got to see if it's God's will. His word is his will. His word is his will. I got his word. This is why God, listen, the one, one guy said, Lord, if you can do anything, he said, heal my son. He said, if. That's what it says. If you read that in the message Bible, he said there are no ifs for believers. It's a word that doesn't even exist in the kingdom of God. It doesn't even exist. What do you mean if? If God said it, say on earth what he said in heaven. You don't have to request things that are already yours. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You notice this, there's nothing that you can ever pray in the will of God that he won't hear. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Can I, can I, it's a different world. Everybody say it's a different world. I'm getting ready to close. God says, when I heard you and you asked something in my will, you had it. I didn't say that you could see it yet. I'm saying that you need to make synonymous with me hearing it, you having it. You know we have more faith in, in than we have more faith in Amazon delivering us something than we do in God. We we got more faith. Because you got a little app on your phone that will tell you it's in transit. Well, tell my daughter's just finding this out this week about something she bought. It's, it's, it's at this facility, and it finally makes it to your city. And you're tracking, watch this, how many stops away. You getting excited about it? Ooh, it's coming. You on the phone calling people, that, that stuff that I bought from Fashion Nova and Shine, I know where y'all shop at, right? I know, I know where it is. All, all that stuff. And you getting excited about it, you already got the hat and the shoes and the belt, the blouse and the shorts, just saying, okay, you got all that stuff, and you're excited, and you done called 20 people. And you just know that it's going to show up. If it don't show up, you're going to be on that phone getting a little testy. But when God says it's yours. Somehow, we get frustrated 
leave the church, start worshiping our ancestors, putting big crystals under our pillows, meditating to all this stuff that's not like God because it's been two days. And God said, when I heard you, you had it. That's called faith. That's real faith. You had it. You had it right then. And God says, when I told you, you had it. Somebody say, when he heard you, you had it. You know where else this shows up? In John chapter 11. When Jesus is standing at the tomb of Lazarus and he said, Father, I thank you. Watch this. That you have heard heard me. If you go from that verse all the way back up to verse 1, you never see where Jesus prayed. He never prayed. It was so confusing to me. He never prayed, which means that what we think is prayer is probably not prayer. Because prayer is not just asking, it's declaring. When did Jesus pray? When the messenger came to him and said, Lazarus, the one whom you love is sick. What was Jesus' reply? This sickness is not unto death. That was his prayer right there. That was his prayer right there. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, which is to say I've never prayed anything that was not your will. I've learned, I've learned how not to ask until his will is revealed. Then when I ask and I know his will, it cannot be denied. It, it cannot be denied. Somebody say, it's a different world. It's, it's a different world. I feel increased in this house. I, I feel increased in this house. My last point is that Holy Spirit in us gives us full access to all that is in God. Gives us full access. Do you know that the devil is defeated? I know we say it all the time, but you, do you know he's really defeated? To, to, to this point, that he's so defeated, the only thing that he can really do is to try to convince you that you're something other than what you are. Hey, eat this and you'll be just like God. I'm already like God. I'm already like God. I, I'm learning. I'm already. You can't give me anything. That has not already been given. Somebody say, after this, things will never be the same again. Come on, everybody standing. I'm going to pray over you. Say it again. Say, after this, nothing will ever be the same again. There's a new wave, and, and I know Pastor Rob will see this. He's not here. But I've literally seen in the last six months another mantle on his life. And Pastor Rob, when you watch this, this is for you. And this is something similar that's going on in my life. But I want to say it to you because I think it's, it's important for this city and this region. I need you to hear this. I need to announce this in this house because your posture concerning him needs to change. I see the molding of a father. I see the molding of a general who is waiting in preparation to be revealed to this region. The Lord says, you have many teachers, but you don't have many fathers. And I sense the, the mantle of a father, and like an apostolic father, coming on him. Whether he ever calls himself an apostle, whether he puts that on Facebook, it, it doesn't matter. The anointing is there. And Pastor Robert, I, I sense men and women who have been caught up in the industry of church. who have been thrown by the wayside because they would not play the game coming to you. I need you to hear this. I'm speaking this to you as a prophet today because with an apostolic anointing comes increase. 
increase. There are a plethora of people who have a word in their mouth that need to be sent out to this generation to preach the gospel as never before who are coming. There are those of you in this house whose status in the body of Christ in terms of your assignment will begin to increase under this anointing. Somebody just say this, said there's an anointing here. H how do I know that? The anointing that rested on Catherine and on the praise team could not be here unless there was a fathering, covering, apostolic grace over this house. And it's here. Now, what does that mean? I, I'm not really familiar with, with church language. It, it simply means that there's more strength, more power, more ease. Freedom Church, there will be things that you tried to do 10 years ago, and it was difficult, that you're going to do right now, and the doors will open. The doors will open. Pastor Robert will know what I mean when I say this. He'll know what I mean. Bro, this is why God wouldn't let you hook up or go back. He, he'll know what I mean when I, when I say this. This is why, because what you're looking for, you need to hear this. What you're looking for in other people was always a mirror to who you are. And they could not handle you when you came to a certain level. And the Lord told me to tell you, Robert, this is the problem right now. They're trying to mold you into their image and not what the Lord planned for you. I'm telling you, in this region, in this region, there will not be a soul, hardly, secular, or spiritual who doesn't know this house. I literally, I, I feel like I'm not even standing in this room. I'm, I'm standing like in some convention center somewhere. We're literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people. The Lord said, Robert, get ready to be asked into rooms that you had to hear about from other people and what happened in those rooms. The Lord said, not only will you be asked into those rooms, you're going to be asked to create rooms that people previously did not have access to, but now they will. For those of you who have a personal vision, I, I see visions all around this house. Your personal vision for your life and your family literally right now coming to pass over your heads. Your vision being fulfilled in the largeness of this vision. Look at your neighbor and say this. Say, this will be a terrible time to leave. <laughs> this will be a terrible time to leave. I, I'm tell, I speak as an oracle of God. I speak as an oracle. Of, there, there's a grace on this house that's going to make thing, things easy. There's a few of you in this room right now, before I pray, there's a few of you in this room right now. You're either looking for a job or you're trying to get promoted on the one. And, and, and for, you, for many of you, it's, about, it's not just about more money. It's about another tax bracket. And you've been trying to do all you can to get there. God said, stop trying. It's already yours. I, I'm, I'm speaking this. I see I'm moving people out of the way. I'm moving people out of the way. I, I got to get out of here. But there, there's, there's money that some of you have been promised. It's being held up. I don't know if it's, it's, if it's by legal means or even if someone owes you. There, there are large sums of money that have been held up that are getting ready to be released. For you to do some stuff. I don't know who I'm talking to. You just, I'm telling you, either by legal means or someone withholding what they know is yours and you haven't went to court yet. The Lord says, I'm going to release by uncommon and unprecedented favor these things over your life. Glory to God. There are many of you, you've been saying, I'm just going to say it. And, and, and this is why you need to be at what forever I do is doing. You're asking God, I need some help in my marriage. Can I tell you this? God says, I'm doing more behind the scenes than I am in front of your face. You have no idea what I'm doing with them. I'm answering your prayer right in front of your face. 
How many believe this? Last thing. La last thing. Last thing before I pray. Here's going to be the, and you're going to hear, I want to hear about it when it happens. Here's what they're going to say, Shasta, about freedom. What are they doing over there? And all you will be able to say is what the angel said to Mary. The Holy Spirit will do this. He will overshadow you. You won't even be able to explain what's happening. You won't be able to explain the healings. You won't be able to explain the restored marriages. You won't be able to explain the land acquisition. I'm speaking with the Lord saying, you won't be able to, it will just happen. Someone will say, I was thinking about you. God said, this is yours. You're coming, you're coming into a Jericho freedom. God says, you're walking into the land I have given you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you right now for what you're doing, what you have done, and what you are going to do. I pray that this word find good ground in the hearts of your people and that nothing external will be able to snatch it out. We bless you, we thank you, we praise you, and we receive it. And everyone who agreed with that, give God the biggest shout you got.